MedCram.com. Welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about pneumothorax today and also chest tube management. So a pneumothorax is when there is air that is introduced around the lung in the thoracic cavity. As you can see here, this patient who is laying on a gurney like this, and what we're doing is we're taking slices this way through their thorax, and this is what we're seeing here. So this is the anterior portion, this is their back down here, this is the left side, this is the right side of their body, and their feet are coming out at us, if you will. And so therefore, this is the left lung right here. As you can see, it is not fully inflated. It is deflated. It should be touching the edge of the inside of the thoracic cage all the way around the edge, just like the right one is on this side. The visceral pleura, which is the covering of the lung here, is rubbing up against the parietal pleura, which is right up against it. When that potential space is filled with air, that's what we call a pneumothorax. Here's a better view again. We can see right here, this is the two layers. We zoom up here again. Here is the visceral pleura, and here is the parietal pleura. And there's this empty potential space in between. When that gets expanded, that's known as a pneumothorax. I'm not going to get into a spontaneous primary or secondary pneumothorax. That's actually for a course that we actually have at medcram.com that we've just released. Today, we're just going to talk about some basics. And really, the problem is, is that if the lungs collapse, they're not going to be exchanging as much air, and the patient is going to be in respiratory distress. However, there is even a worse complication of a pneumothorax, and that's known as a tension pneumothorax. And here we can see a tension pneumothorax, not on the left side that we were talking about before, but on the right side of the patient. And the air is all throughout this area here. You can see that the lung can become very, very small. And all of this is air. What's happened is, is that air goes into the lungs and it leaks out through like a valve here that is made through tissue. So air can escape out, but not back in again. And so with every breath that happens, more and more air is put here into the pleural space until finally it starts to become inflated and starts to push things over to the side. This pressure here is actually going to push on the heart, and when the heart has pressure put on it, blood does not flow to it anymore, and when blood does not flow to it, blood cannot come out of it. And so you basically shut down the cardiac output, which will cause someone to faint and go into cardiac arrest fairly quickly. This is what it looks like radiographically. You can see here we have haziness, spider webby stuff. That's good. That's lung markings all the way out to the periphery. Here, on the other hand, it stops right about here, and we see nothing, no air markings or lung markings anywhere. This is a tension pneumothorax. You can also tell that the trachea, which is here in the midline, has been shifted over to the left-hand side of the patient. So this is a tension pneumo that's going to become worse very quickly if something is not done. And generally what we do here is we put a chest tube into the patient like this so we can evacuate all of this air out of the patient and reinflate the lung back to its normal size and fix the problem. And here you can see what a chest tube looks like. You can see the chest tube here. I'll outline the strip that goes down it so you can see it on a radiograph. Notice there's a little gap there. That's because there is a hole at the end and there's also a hole on the side. That allows air to go in from the tip, but also to go in from the side, down and be sucked out. Here's another example of a tension pneumothorax. Again, we see lung markings going all the way out here on the left, but nothing past this point right here. This is a pretty severe tension pneumothorax that needs to be dealt with pretty fast. By the way, you can also evaluate this, and we talk about this in our lecture series on medcram.com. We also can use ultrasonography. So when you have the parietal pleura, which is right here, and the visceral pleura here, and the lung is moving, you'll see that these two pleural surfaces rub up against each other. And if you were to use an ultrasound here, the ultrasound would go down to this second layer, but not penetrate much further because it's very air dense. An ultrasound doesn't travel very well. In fact, it's going to rebound back. So what you'll see here is you'll see this movement at the deepest layers of the ultrasound. You can see if you were to do that on this side, this is where the visceral pleura is, and this is where the parietal pleura is. And of course, there's going to be absolutely no sliding whatsoever. You're not going to see that. So how would that look on ultrasonography? Let's take a look. So this is going to be a normal lung situation. This is where we have lung sliding. There is no pneumothorax. So the two surfaces are sliding against each other. What you're going to see here is the two surfaces are right here. 
And you'll notice quickly when we start to see it go, you'll see these things moving back and forth and you'll see little lights and flickers as the two sides go past each other. That's called lung sliding. That's a good sign that means there's no pneumothorax. Now, if we take a specific slice of that and we project it over time, what you'll see here is that because there is movement and sliding, everything distal to that is going to be changing. So what you'll see here is this line that's gonna demarcate things. Everything north of this line are gonna be like lines because there's no movement. It's static, it doesn't change over time. So it's like this. This looks almost like waves coming into a beach. On the other hand, because everything is changing distal to that plural line and it's moving around, you'll see this kind of like a static picture that changes and it almost looks like a sandy beach. So this is in fact what's called a sandy beach sign and it shows that there is lung sliding and that there is no pneumothorax. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. See how you see movement right there? Let's take a look at that one more time. So you can see movement there in that line. That means the lungs are sliding. Let's take a look and see what it looks like when there's no lung sliding. Here's no lung sliding. And as a result of no lung sliding and nothing moving, everything looks like lines going all the way across. This looks like a barcode sign. And this is when there's possibly a pneumothorax. It could also show up in other places where a pleura doesn't move against each other. But let's take a look here and see what it looks like under animation. Here it is under animation. Notice you don't see anything sliding back and forth. You don't see little dots moving back and forth across this. That's no lung sliding. We'll go back and take a look at what lung sliding looks like again. Here it is. This is lung sliding now. See the difference? Looks like things are sliding there. Really, the important thing to do is to get a transducer, an ultrasound, when you're seeing patients, and put this on them and see if you can tell that there is lung sliding. If you do it more and more, you'll see what a normal looks like. So let's briefly talk about chest tubes. So this is a very stylized look. Nothing actually looks like this. There's a tube coming out of the patient's pleura, and it's going to a container where it collects. That's maybe what you might think that would look like. Back in the old days, it actually looked very complicated like this. But most systems today are a three-container system. So we have the patient over here and the chest tube coming out. The first thing that we want to do is have the liquid that's coming out of the patient, whether it be blood, pleural fluid, it's got to go into a container and we've got to be able to measure it. So that's the first container. The negative pressure that we're applying to it gets transmitted to the next container and the next container is a water seal. It's like a one-way valve. It allows stuff to come out of the patient but not stuff to go back into the patient. That's really important. So what happens is because it goes down here and it's being sucked, the bubbles come out and go to the surface of this, but they're not allowed to get sucked back in. So the water is going to go back in up to a certain point, but air cannot go in. Only air can come out. This is the exhaust suction pipe here at the top. That gets sucked across. This is the suction controller, the regulator. So here's the wall suction. You can turn this up as much as you want, but the purpose of this container is to make sure that that negative suction doesn't get transmitted to the patient. If you put a chest tube into a patient's chest cavity and you turn up the suction so high, it could actually damage the lung very, very easily. So it's really important to have a suction control to make sure that the suction isn't transmitted to that patient above a certain number. And the number that we typically use is 20 centimeters of water pressure, which is a fairly small amount, and it simulates what the intrapleural pressure often is. This suction applies to here, and notice what happens is, is what's generating this negative pressure above this surface is the wall suction. If I were to go negative 20, let's just say I was to apply negative 20 from the wall, that would cause the water in the center pipe to be sucked down all the way down, but no further than the bottom of this tube, and the rest of it would be then applied to this suction. So this suction would go through to the wall. At the same time, it would pull 20 centimeters of water down this vertical column down to here. For every drop below negative 20, let's say I did negative 30, there would then start to be bubbles that come out from the atmosphere and bubble up this way. So much so that as you increase the suction on the wall, the extra suction is not going to be applied to the patient, but rather it's just going to simply suck in extra air from the atmosphere. And that's how we get the regulator to make sure that the patient is safe. Just a note, if you turn up the suction so much that you have a rigorous amount of bubbles coming up from this pipe, 
it's going to actually evaporate this water faster, and that's not something you want. So you want a steady stream of bubbles that tells you that this is somewhat over negative 20 centimeters of suction, but not that much over. So this is it. This is basically the three chamber container. Let's go through some examples here. Here we have the suction is on, but there's an air leak detected. What happens here is that if we turn on the suction and we have negative 20 centimeters of water suction, then it's going to be transmitted and it's gonna suck here and it's going to cause a suction here, which is gonna be applied to this surface, which is gonna then be applied to this surface, which is then gonna be transmitted back to the patient. If this tube is going into the patient and the tube is going into this intrapleural space and it causes the lung to be fully inflated and there's no more leakage of air, the bubbles here should actually stop because no more air is coming through the system and bubbling. However, if there is a hole in the lung and there is a continuous air leak so that air is still leaking from the lung into the space being picked up continuously, then you will see in this water seal container a continuous flow of bubbles. That's known as a air leak. And the place to see those bubbles is in the center section. So bubbles here simply means that your suction is above the 20 centimeters of water suction. That's what it should normally be. However, if you see bubbles in the center section, what that means is that you still have an air leak. And assuming that you've got no holes in your tubing, an air leak means that you still have a hole in the lungs. That's important to understand because if you were to turn off the suction, that air would continue to accumulate in the intrapleural space and the lung would eventually get smaller and smaller. Now the question is, is would it turn into a tension pneumothorax? And the answer is no, it would not turn into a tension pneumothorax because if the pressure built up in here so high, it would eventually have a way to escape out and then bubble out. So that's important to know because oftentimes I'll see patients in the hospital who have chest tubes just like this one, and they will actually have an air leak. So here's what a typical container might look like. Here's a plurivac. You can see that this section right here is actually the major container where the fluid is contained. This little red area here is the water seal area where you can see air is coming down here and can bubble. So if there's bubbles in here, then you know you have an air leak. And then in the modern chest tubes, they've replaced this regulator with one of these switches, which is more modern, where you can just simply select the setting that you want. And instead of looking for bubbles to make sure that it's going, you just look for this little orange indicator that tells you that the suction is on. On the other hand, this is another type of suction device here, as you can see, plurivac. And here are the three containers. There's the suction container. This is the valve or the water seal. And you can see here there's no bubbles going across at this point. And then here are the bubbles, which are bubbling up. That simply tells you that you have your suction on. And you can see that the water level is at 20, which means that you're at 20 centimeters of water suction. So what would happen if we had a patient with a chest tube and we came to the bedside and we wanted to get a CAT scan on the patient? And this is what we saw in the water seal chamber. We're looking to see whether or not there's a bubble that goes across here. Certainly not continuous, but if we look very carefully at this, ah, we just saw a bubble go across. And what that means is that there is still a small air leak. There is a leak of air which is leaking out of the lungs and into the pleural space. So if we were to take that patient and disconnect them from the suction machine and take them downstairs to a CAT scan, don't be surprised if you would see something like this. So here is the chest tube going in. And if you turn off the suction and there's a small air leak, it's going to accumulate so that you, once again, will see a pneumothorax, even though there's a chest tube here. And you may think to yourself, oh my, the chest tube is on suction and there's still an air leak. Well, in fact, what's going on here is that the chest tube was turned off. So what you want to do in these situations is if you have an air leak on the chest tube, you want to hook it up to a portable suction while the patient is going downstairs. This is even more important if there's a continuous air leak. It would be dangerous to disconnect the patient from suction and take them downstairs for a CT scan if there is still an air leak. So I hope this has been helpful. I want to invite you to come to medcram.com, Medicine Explained Clearly, and we've just released a brand new course on pneumothorax and chest tube explained clearly, where we go over these concepts and much, much more talking about the differences between pneumothoraces, iatrogenic, spontaneous, primary, secondary, the treatments for it, when to put a chest tube in, and when it's just fine to observe. 
This is a course that's really geared for all healthcare providers, whether you're a doctor, a nurse, a PA, a nurse practitioner, a respiratory therapist, knowing what chest tubes are doing and how to read them at the bedside is really important. So I hope this has been helpful. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, and join us at medcram.com.